My name is Kevin um, and my son is called Thomas and he has just gone through a bone marrow transplant because um, he was diagnosed with uh, CGD at Christmas. At five months old Thomas um, picked up chicken pox and from the chicken pox he then developed large abscesses either side of his neck, uh, two on the right side and one on the left. Uh, we then went to the doctor about this and they had told us that it was tonsillitis and to treat it with some penicillin. Um, and it would go away ultimately. Uh, so we went through the full course of penicillin and after about seven days, the abscesses of anything had started to grow larger. So that led us to two weeks in hospital there and three separate trips to theater to remove each abscess from his neck. And whilst there, um, a doctor said he would like to have a look at his immune system. Uh, he, he felt that a five month old baby shouldn't present himself like this. And uh, long story short then, um, about two weeks later, uh, out of intensive care, um, a doctor came up and told us that Thomas suffered from chronic granulomatous disease which unfortunately is a life-threatening condition and certainly a life debilitating uh, condition and um, you know it, it can be cured and the cure would be a bone marrow transplant and if we were ready to go um, Newcastle were ready for us today. It was incredibly difficult because you know he was our first son uh, we had just got him home from hospital after spending two weeks there it was our first Christmas, um, so we had just put up the Christmas tree the day before. When we arrived, Thomas was very unwell. He was very flat, um, completely lethargic, motionless, and um, at that point we had to see, he had an abscess on his liver and a problem with his stomach off the back of the, the surgeries in Belfast that we had no idea about. So first and foremost, we had to tackle the infection. You know, once the liver got under control and the medication was going through, at that point then we actually started our search for a donor. You know, a bone marrow transplant, um, you know, is, is no small undertaking. And as a result of that, you know, we, we knew that we could have lost Thomas. Um, but, I mean, if we go back four or five months, we, we arrived here and we were so nervous of losing him at that point. Um, you know, what, what was the alternative, you know, to sort of try and, you know, tiptoe around with medication until the next time, you know, a really strong fungal or bacterial infection, you know, wound us up back in surgery or, or back to the position where we're here and they got, you know, he's fighting for his life. You know, the, the option of that bone marrow transplant was so massive for us, huge. The likelihood was he had 50% of my marrow and 50% of his mother's, so neither of us were a direct match. So an unrelated donor was where we had to go for our, for our transplant. Initially we got a, a German donor, um, a young male German donor, and when we arrived here at the end of April um, and on the ward, we were told that the registry had removed the donor um, from the registry that morning and we had lost our match. We thankfully had a strong backup at that point and the, the liaison team here contacted the Anthony Nolan Trust and they, they, they turned things around very quickly. It was almost a, a, a perfect donor, uh, almost a perfect match. I just asked that if, if that guy could know that um, his bone marrow went to an 11 month old boy, I'm sure that he would have slept very well that night knowing that he had you know, done such a massive um, undertaking for us anyway, you know, be eternally grateful. So he was 11 months old when we arrived back here for transplant and uh, started the conditioning, you know, 10 days conditioning then of campath and chemotherapy. And it, it, it was difficult too. Um, the first day of campath was very bad because it bursts all your T cells and B cells. So it's almost like one minute you're sitting, normal baby, um, playing about with your toys. And then the next minute, you know, like you're, you're an adult being hit with a full dose of swine flu or a, a huge flu. So that was difficult for us to watch him at that point. Um, but once the first two days of camp path were over, he sort of, his body sort of got used to it and he was back to himself to a certain extent. Then we started the chemotherapy and, um, you know, the chemotherapy, you know, the side effects of it don't really kick in. I felt anyway, to about day five, day six of transplant, and then you will start seeing the hair loss and, you know, when the chemotherapy is going in, it has to come out one way and, you know, as a wee baby, it's coming out through the urine and through his poo. So we, we noticeably seen, um, and around his groin area would get very inflamed almost like a scalding with water um, but we, just, we, we just, just stayed on top of it in terms of keeping it hydrated and you know plenty of clean, uh, clean nappies and creams and potions and stuff like that did the job. The most worried was whenever he went aplastic whenever there was no live cells in his body and um, whenever the chemotherapy and campath had, had basically left him with zero live cells so he had zero immunity so at that point there anything from a, a sniffle to a cold um, any infection whatsoever um, could have 
could have been fatal. Um, so that was very worrying um, from our own perspective, coming down, ensuring our hands were always clean, ensuring you know you were always washed, the toys were clean, nothing came from the floor to his sterile area. You would need to be in that sort of environment to realise just how sterile it is. And um, there's a blue line in the floor and once you go over the blue line, everything inside that area is completely sterile. So you automatically think of the bigger picture, but then you think of the day-to-day -day life of being inside a room underneath an eight foot perspex, you know, rectangle that blows out sterile air. And that ultimately is your son's last line of defense against infection. So we things like that, there were a lot to take in at the time. It was his first birthday and um, 25 days after transplant. It was a really good day and um, the nurses had sterilized lots of presents and brought them in to the right side of the blue line, wrapped them up and left them in his cot. Um, that was a really, really good day. So, you know, it's, it's not all doom and gloom. You know, there were lots of high points. The actual transplant day itself, um, I mean, people say that the transplant day itself is quite sort of an anticlimax, but we didn't find it that way at all. We find it very uplifting. As a parent, you know, the nurses give Thomas's medicine. They, they care for him. They do everything that needs to be done medically. The doctors have a strategy in place as to how they plan the, the overall transplant to go. But as a parent, all we could really give him was our time. So just to make sure that we came in and we were sort of upbeat every day and sort of playful with him. And if he was tired some days, just to hug him and make sure that he was, you know, given the care he needed. But just, just to give him everything we had in terms of our time was all we could give him. And, that's sort of the mind frame we came into it and lo and behold it's worked. <laughs> At the moment he has an oxidative burst um, in his neutrophils so um, whenever he was had CGD he had zero oxidative burst um, so as it stands we're already one step ahead of where we were before transplant um, because he has that oxidative burst. Um, his engraftment as well is 100% donor at present which can be problematic as well because if you have two um, immune systems there trying to come back at the same time you'll have a bit of a tussle as to which one you know becomes dominant so thankfully all Thomas's cells that are alive in his body at the moment all his white blood cells are donor cells which is what we want so you know he, he's very well he's crawling about he's starting to walk he's eating like a horse he's doing brilliant